Genesis chapter 37. I'm going to try to wrap up a, a little bit of a subject I've, I've been talking about for a couple of Wednesday nights. Thank you. Uh, you can stand uh, if you want to. I'd appre I appreciate that. Amen. Just one verse of Scripture, so it'll be a quick stand. Uh, but Genesis chapter 20, or, or verse 20 out of chapter 37. We've been using this chapter for the last several Wednesday nights and talking about the life of Joseph a little bit and talking about the power of your dream. Uh, a couple of Wednesday nights ago, we talked about the place where your dream is conceived. Last Wednesday night, we talked to you about how to advance your dream. And tonight, I want to talk to you uh, from a line out of this scripture. Verse 20 says, come on, let's kill him. That's the one I want to talk to you about. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. And then we can tell our father, a wild animal has eaten him. And then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. So we talked about the place where your dream is conceived. We talked about how to advance your dream. And I want to talk to you for just a few minutes tonight on what will become of your dream. What will become of your dream. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Or standing uh, for the reading of the word tonight. How many of you will help me for just a few minutes? <laughs> I might need a stool. <laughs> that was kind of weak right there. What will become of your dream? I, <clears throat> I've been doing a lot of um, reading and I've been trying to fill my mind with, with things that are good and things that are positive and, and things that will help me to, to uh, bring a better word and a more powerful word to you. I talked to you last week, just a few minutes. I, I didn't realize this was going to make such a big impact last week, but I just brought to you a real life problem uh, that, that came up in my life last week. And, and came up in the life of uh, the people here, you know, because I lead you, then, then it, it's also not a problem necessarily, but just a little mountain that we had to climb. And I told you, you know, that I got that call from the bank, and I told you that uh, they told us that everything looked well and looked good, but then they told us that, that, that we had a little problem. Everybody, everybody remember? Oh, yeah. Everybody remember? Yeah. Now, does everybody remember what they said the problem was? Yeah. That's what they said the problem was. <laughs> That made a lasting impact on, on all the people in here. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess that got out on the, on the website, and uh, I've even had people at work telling me this week that they didn't realize I was such a problem. <clears throat> and, and I said, well, I, don't, I didn't really know how to take that. I tried to take it as a compliment because what they didn't hear, you know, the rest of the story was, man, you're, you're such a charismatic leader that, that that's causing us a little bit of a problem. And uh, they began to explain some things to me. And uh, it, it was kind of crazy to me because last week when, when that happened to me, uh, I had just been writing out some notes that I was going to be teaching for last Wednesday night. And that phone call came on Wednesday morning and I was sitting at my desk writing out some notes. And I had just written out a sentence on my paper uh, last week. And this is where, what we used a lot of last week. But I had just written out a sentence on my paper and the sentence that I wrote out was, my revelation must be greater than my environment. My revelation has to be greater than my environment. Then I get the phone call and I'm sitting there trying to process all of that and trying to digest all of that. And, and I'm trying to understand what they're saying and I'm trying to take it the right way and I'm trying to read into it what needs to be re read into it and I'm trying to leave out what needs to be uh, left out and I look down as I turn back because the way my desk is set up I have a little sidebar that has my computer on it and then the writing station out in front and I had been turned uh, toward the wall to, with the computer but when I turned back to my, my, my writing top and the writing station I looked down at the paper and as soon as I hung up the phone that sentence was the first thing that I saw that your revelation has to be greater than your environment and so the God began to deal with with me about that and and he began to just kinda uh, speak into my spirit and soothe my spirit and calm my mind a little bit and I began to, to to take in what I needed to take in and begin to let go of what I needed to let go and begin to try to have the right frame of mind and then as I got through the rest of my week and and uh, yeah, because how many of you know, like, 
I, I hope you understand, and I'm not trying to minimize anything that you do, but like when you're trying to lead a group of people, and when you're taking the responsibility to lead a group of people, I want to I just say this to you. There's not a, ever a minute that, that I go through in my, in my daily life that I don't feel the weight, and that is not a negative thing, but I don't feel the weight of responsibility for what is happening. I understand that, that what God is wanting to do here is beyond my ability, beyond my capability, just in my flesh. I understand all of that. So I understand and I feel the weight that I, I have to stay in a position where He can use me because if, if I get out of position and if I get out of alignment, then I, I have the ability to mess things up. If you don't believe it, ask Rosanna. Come on. You are kind of worried about where I'm going, I think. But I'll tell you how I can mess things up. Last year, the, the washing machine went out at, at our house. And so we ordered a new washing machine. And when they, they came to bring it out and they asked me, they said, do you want to pay for us to install it? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I've moved a hundred times. <laughs> Literally. I know how to install a washing machine. So... No, I don't need you to help me install a washing machine. I got new hoses. I'm ready to go. And so they, they drop it off at my house, and, and I install it, and I hook the hoses up, and I make sure everything's working, and everything's working. And we'd been without a washing machine for about a week, so the laundry was piling up. I had to go back to work, and I said, I'm going to surprise Rosanna, and there's going to be a load done by the time she gets home. Well, let me tell you something. I surprised Rosanna. Because when Rosanna came home, my house was flooded to the tune of about forty-six hundred dollars worth of worth worth of damage, and uh, it, and it really wasn't my fault. But I had bought a brand new hose, and the and the fitting on the end of the hose where the metal attaches to the rubber, uh, it was faulty, and it had come undone, and so. <laughs> And water was just spraying everywhere and, and going all in the house. And so when, when I got home, Rosanna said, who installed this? <laughs> and I want to tell you guys something right now. For that moment, I wasn't a preacher because I really wanted to lie real bad. It's like a kid being caught, you know. I want, I, no. And I, I said, oh, well, I installed that. And before we knew all that had happened, man, she was not real happy with me because, you know, this house, we just moved in. The floor was all new. And now then, now then you've just bought, you've just, you just messed all this up. And look what you did. And so I know I have a history of messing things up. I can mess stuff up real quick if I get out of line or if I get out of position. And, I, and so I feel that weight of, of responsibility and I understand that it's imperative and important for me to stay in the right frame of mind and to stay in the right position because if I get in my head too much, I start spinning out. Come on. I mean, like if I, if I start trying to figure things out and work things out in my own consciousness and my own awareness of all this stuff, I, I, I can mess things up really, really quick. And, and it was in the process of all this, man, I'm, I'm going to tell you what, uh, God has really been good to me this year. And there's been a lot of uh, personal growth in my life. And I've seen Him more in, in different ways than I've ever seen in my entire life. Just in the past 12 to 18 months of, of my ministry, I've seen God do some tremendous things in my personal personal life. And, I, and I, I'm telling people all the time that I'm, I'm striving to become more aware of Him in what we would call the mundane things of life, just the day-to-day -day things of life. I'm trying to become more aware that He's in those things every day. And as I begin to sit this week and just think about where we need to go and, and just putting it before God and saying, God, you, you know, and you know what we need and you know what we have and you know what we can do and you know what we can't do. And then all of a sudden, this came to me. And I wrote this down too. But I, I, I began to see this and, and I, I was reading this in a book and I took it out of this book that I'm reading and I'm, I'm reading a book called Think Like Heaven. And the guy in the book wrote this and I wrote it down in my journal and he said this. He said, problems are just a way for God to show us Himself in a way that we've never seen Him before. Right. Come on. 
So I'm sitting there thinking about that, and I'm thinking about all this dreaming that we've been talking about, and I'm thinking about things that are going on in my life, and and it just seemed like God just kind of whispered to me, and He said, I want to take that thought that you have there, and I want to take it a step further, and this is what came to my mind, not anywhere that I've read, but I just began to, to think about this. Well, if problems can reveal God to me in a different way than they ever have before, then it's very possible that problems are God's path to promotion of your dream. <laughs> and, and, and see, the, the reason we only got a smattering of applause in here is because everybody wants the fulfillment, nobody wants the problem. And what I've learned here, uh, what I've learned in ministry is, uh, there, life can be reduced to two things, events and processes. I just, I know some of you think that I'm the most simple preacher in the world, and I am. I just simplified your life. There's only, there's only two things that life boils down to, events and processes. And I'm going to tell you what, as humanity, there's not a single person in here, starting, starting right up here, there's not a single person in here that doesn't like events. The big things. The climactic things. We like events. I, I prove it, Larry. I, I'll prove it. We had a seventh anniversary service, and you couldn't find a seat in this house. Amen. People standing in the hallways because it was an event. What we're doing here tonight is a process. Come on, everybody. Let's just be real. This, this, what, man, Wednesday nights are processes. Anniversary celebrations are events. Uh, you know, uh, Christmas is, is a process or is an event, but all the stuff leading up to it that you get all worked up about is a process. Amen. Hello? And, and I guarantee you next Friday morning, many of you are going to wake up with more expectation for next Friday morning than you will wake up with expectation for this Friday morning. Because an event takes on a different connotation. It has a different power to it. And, and you can reduce life down to events and processes. And we all s somewhat enjoy the events or we live for the events, but we don't like the process. I, I tried to tell Kerry and Chance this. On the day that they got married a, a, a month or so ago, I told them that night that we stood in this building and their families were here and it was beautiful and it was sweet. I told them that night right to their face, this is an event. Your wedding is an event. Your marriage is a process. Come on, everybody. Can we be real? And everybody gets excited for the event. But then you got to live in the process. Right? Mm -hmm. I asked Chance the other day. You got to tell him I talked about him good tonight. But I asked him the other day. I said, so... Which one of y'all squeezes the toothpaste in the middle? Oh. <laughs> All those little things you don't know till you start the process, right? Come on. Come on. So life is, life is events. Life is processes. But the process is what brings the dream to fulfillment. And many times in the process, there are problems Come on. Their problems are God's path to the promotion of your dream. How, how many of you understand this? That you, you may get in a storm. This is, this is something that I didn't understand as a child growing up. But, but Jesus told the disciples to get in a ship. And, and they got in a ship. And then they got in the middle of a storm. And as a kid growing up, I never could understand you know, why, he would, why he would do that. Or why they got in a storm. They were doing what Jesus told them to do. They, they, were exactly, they did exactly and obeyed exactly what he told them to do. And yet here they felt, found themselves in a storm that they thought was going to take their life. But really what it was, as I later learned, it was not Jesus trying to kill them. It was trying, him trying to teach them a lesson because what was happening in the storm, storms are not meant to kill you. Storms are there to remove the rough edges off of your life. Amen. Come on. Amen. Storms are meant to mature you. If you make it through the storm, you've grown a little bit. I hate to keep using my, my workout references, but it, it, every Tuesday and Thursday, he's ringing in my ear. I can't get that little voice out of my head. 
And again last night, he told Rosanna and I, he, as we got ready to leave, and we're red and we're sweating and people are laughing at us as we're coming out. <laughs> Y'all always look a little worse when you go out than when you came in. <laughs> Let me tell you something. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, I don't feel real preachery either. <laughs> so that person is fortunate that I didn't have a slip. I was... <laughs> I was sweating and I was tired and he had been made me he he had me doing one arm push-ups and all this kind of crazy stuff man I've never done in my life and I, I'm sitting there thinking about what in the world is going on here and and when we get through he comes by and he gives us knuckles and he tells us he loves us he calls us family I love you family and then he says you guys are stronger now than you were half an hour ago You're stronger now than you were half an hour ago because what, what you didn't think you could get through, what you didn't think you could live through. I, I, I stood at our back door last night, my knees trembling in my arms, not able to put the key in the lock. And I told Rosanna, uh, one thing that I know is I lived. <laughs> I lived. I made it. And, and you know what? Every day that I make it, I realize that there's some things falling off of my life. There's some physical things that are falling off my life. I, I went to the doctor two weeks ago, and the doctor took, all, took me off all my blood pressure medication, did all of that kind of stuff. And I'm just giving you some practical stuff here tonight. But see, there's, there's some stuff that's falling off my life because I'm pushing through a process, and there's some rough edges that I've allowed to get out of control, and I'm learning about myself, and I'm growing. That's what you ought to be doing in the Spirit. And when storm comes, to your spiritual life. It is not meant to kill you or destroy you. It's meant to knock the rough places off because God is trying to grow you up. Hear me tonight, guys. If you keep circling the same mountain for 40 years, you are immature. At some place, you have to stop and grow up. If you're fighting the same, if, you, if you've been in church, if you've been saved for 10 years, and you're fighting the same battles today that you did on your first day of salvation, you haven't grown. Amen. And it is our responsibility, listen, it's our responsibility to grow. You have to take responsibility for your life. You have to take responsibility for your dreams. God can give you a dream, but, but God is not going to sit back and do everything for you because you don't like the process. God's not going to skip the process and give you an event just because you don't want to do the, the hard things that it takes to get to where you're going. Am I making any sense? You have to grow through the storm. And so we've been talking about Joseph. And men, you talk about somebody that had some storms. You talk about somebody that went through some things in his life. Here's what I've come to understand about Joseph's story. This is something I've understood for a very long time. I, I, I really am a, 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 a pretty private person. I was laughing at Gwen and Leah a while ago. <laughs> Leah got her a place here in town, so she's not living all the time out with her mom. And I saw them. It just happened. They just moved in Sunday. And I saw her right here with her mom uh, tonight. And they were hugging each other like they hadn't seen each other in six years. <laughs> and I, I was just giving them a hard time. And I laughed at my son this week because, you know, Chaz left last, a Sunday a week ago. He left and went to start his new job in Galveston. And, and they're getting ready to move and all that other stuff. They're doing all that. And his wife stayed here to finish out. Her, her time at her job and, and Sunday marked a week that they had been apart and on Monday morning uh, Rosanna gets a, a message and said I have today and tomorrow off I'm in Dallas I, I needed to come see my wife <laughs> and I'm thinking man they've been apart a whole week <sighs> like like a whole week. Like, Rosanna would pay somebody to take me for a week. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Two, if you can make it. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> but you, t you, talk about, you talk about Joseph, man. 
and, and me being a private person, that's where I differ, I think, from Joseph because I can be by myself and it doesn't bother me. Rosanna can tell you that. I, I can be by myself and I'm, I'm good. In fact, man, I cherish by myself time. I like getting by myself, you know, and I don't have to have a lot of company and a lot of noise and all that kind of stuff. And there's things God does. I tell you guys, I try to tell you what God tells me, but I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of stuff that He tells me that I don't tell you because I don't want you laughing at me. <laughs> and so I just kind of hold on to it and keep it to myself because once it happens, then, then I say, yeah, I kind of knew that was coming. I had, I had somebody call me. I had somebody call me this week and send me a message this week. Danielle sent me a message about something exciting happening in her life. And I, to, I told her after it was all said and done, I said, I know you're probably going to think I'm crazy, but I saw that in my spirit two weeks ago. I saw that in my spirit two weeks ago. But I didn't want to say anything to you because I didn't want you to think I was crazy. But Joseph didn't have that problem. God showed him something. He just tell everybody. Blah, 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 blah. I had a dream, and you're going to bow down to me. I'm the younger brother, you're the elder, you're going to bow down to me, you're going to serve me, it's going to be great. What do you think about that? Well, we don't think that's so cool, man. And, and Joseph, it wasn't, it, listen, he had one dream and told them and they got upset. That He didn't learn. I mean, we've all built Joseph up to be this great guy, and I'm sure he was, but he probably wasn't too bright. He didn't have a lot of discernment or common sense because he had one dream and they got mad at him for telling him. Then he had another one and went and told him that one. And let me tell you where the second one got him. In a pit. Because they got tired of hearing it. Because listen to me, people that aren't connected to your heart, people that don't hear what you hear from God, people that don't see what you see from God will quickly and easily misunderstand your dream. You can't tell everybody your dream. You can't tell everybody. I'm, I'm, listen, there's probably very few people in your life that you're going to have around you at any one given time that you can really trust with your dream and with your heart. You can't just go out here and just broadcast and spread everything because people will think you're mad because, see, really the thing is God wants to do some things so great in your life that if you told people, they would look at you and say, there's no way that could come out of that. And what you need to understand is God has something great in your life, but not everybody will understand understand it so some things you just need to learn to hang on to and they misunderstood his dream and the Bible says that when they misunderstood his dream they said let's kill him let's throw him in a in a pit let's kill an animal take the animal's blood smear it on his coat let's take it back to our dad and tell our dad that he died and we'll be done with this mess we're tired of hearing about these dreams and listen to this they they put him in a pit they put him in a pit. And the Bible says that after they put him in a pit, they sat down to eat lunch. Sat down, they sat down to eat. And Joseph, their brother, is in a pit. I wonder how many people we've put in pits over lunch. <laughs> that we've sat around tables talking about people. Ain't nobody talking to me now. Hallelujah. I wonder how many times I've been put in a pit after preaching. And people go to lunch on Sunday. That idiot Larry standing up there talking about hope and dreams and faith and belief and love and God's going to do this and God's going to do that. You just sat down at lunch and put me in a pit. And that's what they did to Joseph. They sat down to eat, going on about their lives, and put him in a pit because they misunderstood his dream. There's three quick things I want to give you, and I'm going to be done tonight. But just because Joseph got put in a pit, it didn't keep him from realizing his dream. And there were three things specifically that I want to give you that Joseph did in order to realize his dream. The number one thing that Joseph did we talked about where your dream is conceived. Everybody in here, listen to me. Everybody in here ought to, have a, ought to have a dream for your life. Every person in here ought to have a dream. 
I want to tell you this right now. You were not created to get up in the morning, brush your teeth, go to work, come home, watch TV, go to bed, get up the next day, brush your teeth, go to work, come home, watch TV, go to bed. That is not what you were created for. That is not what you were created for, Cassandra. That is not what you were created for. I see everything. Hallelujah. You weren't created for that. You were created for a purpose. There is something that God wants to do that is bigger than what you are doing right now. God didn't save you just to punch a ticket to heaven and for you to come to church on Wednesdays and Sundays and just hold on until Jesus comes and, oh, I'll fly away and when the roll is called up yonder and that's all it's ever going to be. That is not what you have been saved for. You have been saved to make a difference. You have been saved and set apart for a purpose and a plan. If you don't have a dream, you need to begin to pray to God to give you a dream. Absolutely for your life because he has something that he wants you to do and and but but the first thing that you're gonna have to do in order to see your dream fulfilled you know where it starts it, it comes from a word from God that's where it's conceived the place where dreams are conceived we talked about how to advance it we talked about what you have to do to it to advance the dream and you we, we've talked about all that but if you're gonna see it all the way to the end one of the first things the most important thing that you could ever do is what Joseph did and Joseph refused to stay hooked on pain. If there is ever anybody that had a reason to mumble and to complain and to murmur and complain and to feel bad about his circumstances and to feel... Man, wrapped up in the story of Joseph is every bad dysfunctional family thing you could ever come up with. Come on. I mean, didn't get along with his, didn't get along with his brothers. They hated him. And, and then, then his daddy made things worse because his daddy, you're my favorite. So mom and dad are adding fuel to the fire and there's all this dysfunction going on and you got this little run of a kid running around out here having these big dreams and that just wasn't the way things were supposed to be. Every dysfunctional thing that you can imagine was going on in that family. Then Joseph's life, he's put in a pit. He's taken from a pit and sold into slavery. And from slavery, he finds himself in a bad position. And from that bad position, he ends up in prison. And all these things happen in Joseph's life. And Joseph, if anybody had a right to be hurt, and if anybody had a right to be disappointed, and if anybody had a right to be mad at their circumstances and mad at the world, Joseph could have said, I have a right to do this. But he refused to stay hooked on pain. He said, I will not be a victim. And if you're going to see your dream come to pass, you cannot remain a victim all of your life. Everybody in here has hurt somebody. Somebody has hurt everybody in this room. Hmm. <laughs> Roseanne and I are aware of a situation where it took the death of a family member to bring a huge family back together. What had been, what it, people separated, not talked for years. And it took a tragedy in a family to bring that stuff back together. You know what? Man, when it all comes down to it, listen to me. When it comes down to it, boy, this is a good time of year for this. When it comes down to it, it really doesn't matter in the end who was right, who was wrong. It doesn't matter who said what, who did what. Man, your dream is too important for you to get hung up on being a victim. It, man, if, if all you do is live your life being a victim, that is a sorry kind of life to live. It'll suck the life right out of you. You've got to refuse to stay hooked on pain. The second thing is, watch this, the second thing that Joseph did or didn't do, however you want to word this, Joseph, after he's put in the pit, he's sold into slavery, he ends up in a guy named Potiphar's house. And Potiphar had a wife who had a wandering eye. And Joseph, the Bible says, he was a good looking dude. Hello? And there ain't nothing, I need to speak correct grammar here. There is not anything wrong with noticing, seeing, acknowledging beauty. Because God made beautiful things. 
I say this to you all the time. That, that lady or that gentleman that you pass in Walmart that is pleasant to the eyes, there, there's no sin in noticing that somebody is beautiful or handsome. The sin is when you start stalking them around Walmart. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Come on. Hello? It would have been, there would have been no problem for Potiphar's wife to, to notice that Joseph was a handsome young man. But she began to have an appetite for what her eyes saw. And she began to try to entice him and seduce him to come and lay with her. That's what the scripture says. Come on, just, just lay with me. And he, he wouldn't do that. I mean, it started out first, she, she would come to bed with me. And then when he wouldn't do that, it got all the way down. Well, we, we don't have to do anything, just come lay here by me. That's exactly what she said. She just kept trying to tempt him, kept trying to tempt him, kept trying to tempt him to do what was against his, his integrity. And if you're going to see your dream, God gave Joseph a dream way back there. But if he would have remained a victim, he would have forfeited his dream. And the second thing that you can't do is you can't ever forfeit your influence through failure in your integrity. Amen. You cannot forfeit influence through failure in your integrity. Man, let me tell you something. I tell, I tell the young people that are around me and helping me and working with me and I, I really... I try to pour into them, try to teach them. I'm not, I, I don't claim to be a leadership guru. I'm not saying I'm the best that there is. So you don't even have to send me nasty notes about that. But I try, I try to tell those that work around me and work with me, man, you, you can't afford to lose influence. You have, to, you have to remain in your integrity because if you lose influence through failures in integrity, it has a way of collapsing your dream. Does that make any sense to anybody here? See, what feels good for the moment will rob you of your future. Woo! Come on. Man, what feels good for the moment. You, you, and, and I'm not trying to get into stuff I shouldn't get into here tonight. But you think about most of the things that we allow ourselves to get into that we don't need to be into, whether it's relationships or habits or whatever. For the most part, the things that we allow ourselves to dive off into, they only last for moments. The feeling only lasts for moments. A man or a woman will sell their family. They'll sell their family of 20 years out for 15 or 20 or 30 minutes with strange fruit. Hello? They'll, they'll sell it out for a moment and then when that momentary feeling is over, BAM! What I got here cost me what I had here. Well, you are quiet now. I, I, that, that's what happens to people who, who do drugs, who drink. Because what ends up happening is it takes more and more and more to get that same feeling. You go deeper, 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 deeper to, to replicate and duplicate that feeling that you first had. And what you end up doing is you end up mortgaging your future. Come on, everybody. And, and the Scripture said that Joseph ran from Potiphar's wife. In order to see your dream come to pass, if you really believe that God has something that He's wanting to do in your life, through your life, with your life, then there are some things that you don't need to walk from. There are some things you need to run from. You, you, you don't need to be a victim and you need to maintain your integrity. And if it means running, then run with all that you have. The Scripture said, flee! 
youthful lust. Flee those things that will damage your integrity. Run from those things that will cost you influence. Stay away from those things that will damage your dream because this moment you'll miss this great thing that God has right here. Amen? And number three, let me hurry. Is it, is it 720? Yeah. Okay. Somewhere. And the third thing, I have five minutes here. The third thing that Joseph did or didn't do, however you want to use it, he didn't stay hooked on pain. He didn't lose his integrity. And the third thing, he refused to allow his environment to define who he was. <laughs> Joseph got put in prison. When, because listen, when, when he wouldn't stay, when, when he ran from Potiphar's wife, as he's running from Potiphar's wife, she grabs his coat. Yep. And when her husband comes home, and see, Joseph said, man, coat or no coat, I'm out. She can have the coat, man. I'm leaving. And when he got out, she had the coat. And when her husband got home, she made up a story and said, that servant that you hired tried to rape me. And he, he tried to impose himself upon me. And Potiphar became so angry that he threw the dreamer in prison. See, his brothers aren't around for all this, but this is what his brothers were talking about. We're going to start this process. We're going to put him in this pit and we'll see what will become of that dream. We're going to see what's going to become of Joseph's dream. And Joseph had all these opportunities. He could have become bitter and a victim. He could have lost his integrity by moral failure and all the other things that went with that. And, and, and he could have, his dream could have died and the dream could have come to nothing and the dream would, would have just, just been just that, just words that he spoke. But how many of you know there are some dreams that God gives that just refuse to die? That's the kind of dream that I want in my life. A dream that refuses to die. No matter what I come against, no matter what comes against me, no matter how I have to go, no matter where I have to go, I want a dream in my life that refuses to die. And because Joseph had a dream in his life that refused to die, even in prison, Joseph said, I refuse to allow this environment to define who I am. Maybe you didn't know this, maybe you did. But from the time Joseph told his brothers that they would bow down to him to the time that they actually came seeking grain and bowed down to him in Genesis chapter 50. From Genesis 37 to Genesis chapter 50, 22 years elapsed. Come on, everybody. 22 years went by from the time the dream was birthed until the time, or from the time it was conceived until the time it was birthed. 22 years passed by. But in 22 years, Joseph said, I refuse to let the environment that I'm in define who I am. God gave me a dream that I'm going to rise up and be great. I may be in the lowest place that I can be right now, but my dream lives. My dream lives. My dream lives. My dream lives. And while he's in prison, Joseph meets two guys, a butler and a baker. And the butler and the baker, see man, woo, the butler and the baker both had dreams. And isn't it funny that the only man who could interpret the dreams was a dreamer? And they had these two dreams. Pharaoh had these dreams and he called them. And they couldn't get it just right. There's a whole other message here that I don't have time to preach. But the butler was always responsible for the wine. The baker obviously was responsible for the bread. When those two went before Pharaoh and couldn't interpret his dream, the baker got killed, but the butler lived. I have that backwards. You are supposed to catch that stuff. Baker lived. Listen. I have it right. Butler lived. The baker died. I'm, I'm positive. 
Because here's what happens. The modern, the modern day, listen, the modern day church, the butler carried the wine, the baker carried the bread. Wine is synonymous of spirit. Bread is synonymous of the word. People, people have this strange desire for the wine, but nobody wants the meat of the word. He let the thing live that felt good. But the thing that could sustain him, he caused him to die. I don't have time to preach all that. And Joseph tells them when they go up, he says, man, you need to remember me when you go before Pharaoh. And when they couldn't interpret the dream, after two years, the guy remembers Joseph and he said, I know a man that can interpret your dream. And he's in prison. Watch this. I'm done. Joseph didn't allow his environment to define him because when they came back and said, Hey, Joseph, it's your day. Pharaoh wants to see you. Joseph had been waiting for this moment for 22 years. And the Scripture says that when they came to get Joseph and told him he had an appointment with Pharaoh, that the first thing he did was bathe and shave and he cleaned himself up for his appearance before Pharaoh. How many of you understand that what Joseph was doing was positioning him for the appointment that he was about to make? Absolutely. Come on. He was positioning him for the appointment that he... Oh man, I, I need to quit. It's getting good right here at the end. But here's what you need to understand, Tanisa, about all this. is what, what you need to understand is you can't allow your environment to define you because your breakthrough is going to come on just an ordinary day. And if you're not ready and if you're all messed up in your head and you've allowed your environment to start changing who you are, you will miss the opportune time for your, for your dream to come to pass. Because I tell you what, the day that David killed Goliath was just an ordinary day. The day that blind Bartimaeus got healed, it was just an ordinary... It started as an ordinary day for him. Are you understanding what I'm saying? The day that those lepers got healed it started out as an ordinary day for them but there came a moment in time where they had to recognize this is what I've been waiting on and if they had not positioned themselves properly they would have missed that moment you cannot allow the environment that you're living in right now to pull you back so far that you don't hear the voice of God and when you're being called out rise up and position yourself for what's about to happen in your life Joseph His brothers come before him. You can stand. Thank you. But Joseph's brothers come before him. They don't know that it's him. And Joseph recognizes them. 